Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Atlanta History Center. I'm Claire Haley, Vice President of Democracy Initiatives and Author Talks here for the History Center. I'm sitting here tonight with three great scholars I'm very excited to have here at Atlanta History Center tonight. We're joined by Fitzhugh Brundage, uh, Johnson's Buck, and Scott Nelson. They are just three of many contributors to this new volume, A New History of the American South. It just came out a couple weeks ago, so we're very excited to be here in discussion with them tonight. Um, each are professors of history, each have different areas of expertise, so we have a lot of ground to cover tonight. Um, and so I'm going to briefly introduce them and then we will jump right in. Uh, Fitzhugh Brunge is sitting here on the end. He's the editor of this wonderful volume. He's the William B. Umstead Professor of History at the Univers University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So welcome, uh, Fitz, Thank you. from North Carolina. We appreciate you being here. Um, seated next to him is John Sinsbach. He teaches early American history at the University of Florida and drove up here from Gainesville to join us. So we're very grateful to you, John, for being here tonight. Welcome. Thank you. And lastly, on the end, uh, we have uh, Scott Nelson, who is the Georgia Athletic Association Professor of History at the University of Georgia. Uh, drove over from Athens today. Thank you for being here with us today, Scott. Thanks so much for having me, Claire. So like I said, this book covers a lot of ground. It goes back several thousand years, actually, and <laughs> takes us up pretty close to the present. Um, so it truly is a comprehensive history of the South. Um, but with so many contributors, with so much ground to cover, I thought we would start with just the basic question to the editor, and that is, how did this project initially come about? Well, it came about when an editor from the University of North Carolina Press came to me two decades ago <laughs> and uh, suggested that it was time to have a, a new interpretive history of the American South. And uh, I, I was keen to do it, but there are, Life intervened, <laughs> and it took, a longer, it took longer than I would have expected. But part of the challenge was we wanted to pull together a team of really great scholars who, I, I hope they won't be offended, we wanted sort of mid to late mid-career scholars. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it took us so long to bring the book out that <laughs> we're a little further in our career. I moved from, <laughs> from mid to late right. during that period. Right. Yeah. right, but in any case, the goal was to get people who would have fresh things to say about the South, and not just get fresh things said about the South, but try to get the authors to work together collaboratively. So the book is an ensemble effort as opposed to single authors writing post whole chapters. And I'll just say that makes it a little, little bit more challenging to write the book because you have to start with the early authors. So John was one of the earliest contributors, not only in the period, but also in, content, in the actual writing of it. And then we worked our way to the 20th century. So uh, weaving that together was a conscious goal of the volume from the outset. And I think that's what distinguishes it, for example, from some of the other works that are either single author or else they are multi-volume single author, histories of the South. Mm -hmm. And I wanna touch on the concept of the South really quick before we move into talking about some more kind of content specific things. But you know, it's a new history of the American South but as I said, it goes back to many, many years before the concept of a United States would have existed. Um, and in the introduction to the book, you give some, some guidance about what this book is not and the things that it's not framed around. Um, one of the things that as you know, someone born in the raised in the South made me kind of giggle as you said, this book, you know, it's not, we're not looking at the, con this, the South through this lens of Southern distinctiveness because we think we're so different or so special. <laughs> um, but we're also not looking at the South through several different lenses as well. Um, so how did you, for purposes of this volume, mm -hmm. how did you define the South and uh, both place and time period? What led you in that direction? Well, with regards to time period, admittedly, this is the book that focuses on the history of the region from before European context, but largely through the era of the emergence of a Euro-American civilization in what we call the South. So while we do go back hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years in some instances, the focus is really, we'll say, 1500 to the present, mm -hmm. admittedly. 
But in thinking about that, we didn't want to start with the assumption that the history of the region was the history of Europeans in the region. So, and we also didn't want to start with the assumption that there was one moment in time when somehow the South became the identifiable thing that we call the South. So it, it, it may sound complicated, but it, the way we worked was backwards, so to speak. We all think of the South appropriately, because it's the way we commonly talk about the South, as essentially the states that were part of the Confederacy. And maybe some people throw Kentucky in and Oklahoma in, and there are good reasons to do that. So we accept that. That's the vernacular use of the South. But we wanted to look at the history of that territory throughout the entire span of time, as opposed to starting at, say, Jamestown or St. Augustine, and then tracing European settlement out from that. And the reason why that's important is the South looks very different in 1500 or 1600 or 1700 or 1800, for that matter, mm -hmm. if you're paying attention to all of the people who live in what we now think of as the South, as opposed to just essentially Euro-Americans. Mm -hmm. So it makes a much more, I'll call it, cosmopolitan South. And John, in, in your essay, or your chapter, Indians, Africans, and Europeans in the early South, so kind of taking us from that, that uh, foundation that Fitz just laid about you know, naming what was the South. So your work delves into when the South, what area that we now know as the South, started to become populated with people besides the native inhabitants of this, of this region. Um, so you talk a lot about how people from three different continents came together in a relatively not super large area of land, right, for the first time for a lot of them. So can you talk about um, the early history of that initial contact and how the relationships between um, white settlers, Native Americans, um, enslaved Africans brought over from, from Africa, how those things started out and then how they changed over the course of the period that you're writing about, because there was quite a stark difference between where you start your work, this chapter in the book, and then where you end it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the larger question, to get back to what Fitz was saying, is how do we define the South? And the, the sort of the earlier centuries that I was writing about, uh, you know, historians uh, like myself who write about that period, uh, you know, have this conundrum, like how do you write about this region that became the South before it was the South. Mm -hmm. Nobody in the year 17 said, 1710 said, oh, I really like living in the South. Um, <laughs> so, but, but during that period from, say, 17, 1600 up to, say, the middle of the 18th century, saw profound demographic changes where uh, in the year 1600, you know, essentially uh, the entire population would have been uh, you know, uh, indigenous people, Native Americans, uh, you know, by the time the Spanish and English and eventually the French begin settling, uh, small pockets of colonization in Florida and Louisiana and Virginia and the Carolinas, mm -hmm. uh, and then begin bringing in enslaved Africans, mm -hmm. uh, you see this profound transition where because of disease, warfare, slave trading, the indigenous population begins to decline precipitously. Mm -hmm. So where they go from 100% of the population in the year 1600, essentially, by 1750, they are, they are down to about 20% of the population. Uh, and the European and African populations have risen dramatically by that point. Uh, paradoxically, though, most of the South what we now call the South, was still in native hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains, this was still native territory. Mm -hmm. This was still dominated by indigenous people, even though their populations had begun to decline dramatically. Uh, so what you then see toward the period of the American Revolution and into the 19th century was uh, Euro-Americans and, and enslaved people beginning to push further and further south and west and displacing indigenous people even more. So, so this period of 150, 250 years in, in, you know, involves tremendous changes in population and culture and, uh, and economics. And did that look different um, in different colonies depending on which European country was settling them? Because I think sometimes in the US we have a tendency to talk about 
when we talk about early American history, we forget about Florida for some reason, mm -hmm. the Spanish who were there. Like we, we tend to talk about the British colonies. So mm -hmm. did you see any trends or differences between say Spanish, French, British, what that looked like? Uh, of sure, of course, yeah. And that's one of the things that we tried to emphasize in this volume is the fact that, uh, that you, you, know, you had uh, all these different you know, colonial projects going on with the French in Louisiana. So you have um, a Catholic zone of settlement along the Gulf Coast from Louisiana through Spanish Florida. And then when you go north and confront the Carolinas, then that's settled by the English. So there's, there's a religious tension built in there, Catholic, Protestant, mm -hmm. the wars of religion that have started in Europe, mm -hmm. leave the Atlantic and come to, uh, come to the Americas. And that, that's very much a, a product of that. Um, with corresponding changes and, and uh, differences in the way those, those societies are, are structured. A higher degree of incorporation of African Americans and indigenous people in the Catholic societies than in, mm -hmm. than in uh, Protestant British colonies, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the other frames of the book um, that's laid out at the beginning is that the South is a region that sees a lot of upheaval over many years. This isn't necessarily unique to just the South, mm -hmm. um, but certainly is a defining feature. So the third author we have with us tonight, um, Scott, you talk about, you know, we're skip forward a couple hundred years, stay <laughs> with me. Um, <laughs> your essay focuses on the aftermath of the Civil War. So. Mm -hmm. We're starting out talking about the conception of the South, the people moving in and forming what we now know as that territory. Um, and then in many ways, after the Civil War, you have a situation where 40% of the Southern population, give or take, um, went from being considered property um, right. in the eyes of the law um, to becoming citizens. Right. Um, some of them, the men in that case, being considered for at least a time voting citizens. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have j a massive demographic shift there mm -hmm. and the shift in the conception of who gets to be a Southerner and who gets to participate in society. Right. So your essay is entitled The Bourbon South. Um, so right. first of all, I wonder if you could uh, enlighten us on the, the title and sure. then uh, you start out with a lot of Atlanta history. So given our audience tonight, I right. thought that might be fun to dig into. Uh, yeah, so the Bourbons are, you know, immediately after the war, you have black and white settlers moving into the South with the Flor uh, Southern Homestead Act, lots of uh, black families getting land, um, and, you know, buying land. Um, we see tr a tremendous number of people growing cotton for the first time who had never grown cotton before. Um, and the Bourbons are the ones who, uh, the, the story about the Bourbons in France is that they, um, uh, that they never forget, uh, what, what's, the, what's the expression, that they, um, that, they, that they never learn and they never forget. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so the Bourbons are the people who come in and try to retake uh, the South and make it a white enclave in which, you know, uh, uh, white Southerners are kind of ruled the roost. And so they're called the Bourbons by their critics, by the populists and mm -hmm. others, because they, they just want to remember again and again what the South was before the war, what the South was during the Civil War. And so that, fa that obsession with kind of, um, uh, and, and, you know, dressing up as Confederate uh, generals, dressing up as old South planters, uh, all of this memorialization where you're trying to recreate uh, some imagined South. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the South is actually being brought together for the first time after the war. The Southern states actually weren't connected by and large by railroads because they were so, so, much, so supported by the Southern states individually that they prevented the states from joining each other. North Carolina didn't want any traffic going to South Carolina. Oh. South Carolina didn't want any traffic going to Georgia. It's really only when the Confederacy comes in that you see a continuous railroad that goes from Richmond to Atlanta. So Atlanta is not a place really of any importance until the Confederacy brings uh, bridges, you know, Atlanta to Richmond, largely to feed uh, the Confederacy. And, and then you start to see a South that goes all the way to Texas. Mm -hmm. And you start to see this convergence. And the peculiar thing about that is there's this environmental catastrophe that mm -hmm. then follows when you bring these railroads through and you start to see yellow fever and all these other uh, diseases that had previously just been coastal spreading throughout. You see pellagra and scurvy and a lot of other diseases that are uniquely Southern that have to do with 
all this cheap food that starts coming in by railroad into the South. And that cheap food doesn't have riboflavin, it doesn't have vitamin C, it doesn't have iron. And so lots and lots of uh, white and black people are eating food that's not especially good for them. And so you see this slowness and all of these diseases and all of these other things. So the South is kind of, I would argue, becomes something in, in this period. There really is a kind of uh, South. Uh, but it's one that's, at least for uh, people like Henry Grady uh, in Atlanta, is about remembering a kind of South that in which, you know, there were the, the Moonlight and Magnolias kind of uh, story of the South. Henry Grady with the Atlanta Journal Constitution kind of puts together as a bourbon the way of excluding black people from voting. Mm. So he kind of comes up with, through the Supreme Court, comes up with this way of um, preventing black people from voting, not explicitly, but implicitly. And that's, uh, that's the kind of story of the South. And the, and the bourbon South is the kind of arrival of the bourbon triumvirate in Atlanta, who they still see when you go into the uh, state house. And the Bourbon Triumvirate ensures that it's uh, by and large only gonna be black people, uh, white people that are gonna be voting and only white people that are gonna be on juries. Mm -hmm. That's when we see the rise of lynching. That's when we see all of the other kind of ills that um, are distinctively part of the South. Uh, building off of that, digging into some of the mechanics of that mm -hmm. a little bit more, would, I mean, this question is open to anyone. Can you talk a little more about, you mentioned the Supreme Court specifically, right. but there are some other things that are more Georgia or even Atlanta specific. Would you go into that a little bit? Um, yeah, so, so Georgia, bec so most of the cotton that's grown in the South is, you know, you need 200 frost-free days to grow cotton, and so it's kind of the deep South that grows cotton. After the war, when the railroads come through, the only way you can get credit is from, you know, all the banks are destroyed by the war. The Confederates come in, they take all the gold out of the vaults, they give them Confederate bonds, and then after the war's over, the bonds are useless or are valueless. And so mm -hmm. the only way to get credit is to grow cotton, and that means that people who are up around here, mm -hmm. up in the hills, who would never have grown cotton in the 1830s or 1840s are suddenly growing cotton because it's the only thing that you can get cash for. And, um, and, and credit for it. So country stores and all these other things. When you think about the Cracker Barrel, we think about it as an old fashioned thing. But the Cracker Barrel was the cutting edge of the South in the 1860s and 1870s. It was the institution that gave you credit for growing cotton, that provided you the food that you needed, provided all of these things. And so a lot of distinctively, think that we think of as distinctively Southern are very much new things. Mm -hmm. And Atlanta becomes the hub for the Southern Railway a consolidating railroad run by radical Republicans initially um, that, that joins the South together. And most of the cotton then, a lot of the cotton ends up going out of Virginia rather than, than through Georgia. So Georgia becomes a kind of colony in a way. Uh, its, its relationship to the Euro U.S. economy changes uh, pretty drastically as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting when you mention Henry Grady and the Moonlight right. Magnolias uh -huh. kind of conception, but then you also think about what he was known for, which was the phrase, the New South. Right. Um, so explain, <laughs> how do you both <laughs> right. go back to the past, and then you, but you're saying yeah. that we're making something yeah. new. Yeah, so, so he, he gave a speech uh, at, the, at uh, the Union League in 18, uh, around 1880 or 81, is that right? That's, um, I think so. Yeah, and in which he says, you know, we welcome you to the South. The South is thrilling with new capital, and it imagines the South as a woman. And it, we, we first start to see the South as a kind of female character. The mm -hmm. South needs capital. The South is thrilling with you know, investment. And, and in fact, what he's offering is women. He's offering lots and lots of white women who have uh, lost husbands or fathers during the, uh, the, the Civil War. So there's a, you know, the, uh, a very large number of white men are wiped out. Uh, black men as well, but a lot of white men are who are wiped out by the war itself. And so there are all these unattached women. Atlanta is a city of women, um, black and white women. And these are going to be the hands that are going to work in the cotton mills. And so rather than just growing cotton, we're also going to see industrialization and urbanization. Um, and, and industrialization and the urbanization in the South is not actually all, it's not what we see here. It's not these 20-story uh, buildings. It's mm -hmm taking cotton and turning it into cloth. And it's taking timber and turning it into furniture. It's taking tobacco and turning it into cigarettes. It's taking the raw materials and going just one step up 
That's what the South is. And so when we talk about urbanization and industrialization, places like Atlanta, we're talking about taking those raw materials and just doing one more thing with them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I want to go back a little bit before the, the Civil War because I want to touch on uh, John, some of what you kind of left off with, because obviously we skipped a large time period, right? Um, so during this time, there was a shift, you know, in the way that that um, African enslaved Africans and African Americans and white people were relating to one another. But I wanted to ask, I don't want to leave this out about the Native American piece. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about how the population was rapidly declining due to disease, due to war, due to other factors, mm -hmm. um, but as the definition of the South expands too, you start including things like Oklahoma, where of course there's a large Native American uh, population. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about while all this is going on, simultaneously what do we see going on uh, in the lead up to the Civil War, skipping back, um, with the Native American piece? Because that becomes of course very important after the Civil War too. Well, um, well as I said, uh, during, the, uh, you know, during the 18th century, most of the South, even though the preponderance of the population was, was steadily becoming more and more European and African, and the indigenous population was declining, uh, even af after the American Revolution, up well into the 19th century, most of the South was still claimed by Native people and still occupied there. Um, what, what you see, though, from, from the period, essentially, when the Constitution was signed in, in, you know, in 1788, and you know, up until the first two or three decades of the 19th century, is uh, a, an increasing pressure uh, driven largely by the federal government, uh, as well as speculators and privateers uh, to acquire native land and dispossess native people from their homeland. And, and so what you see uh, uh, gradually under, you know, especially under Andrew Jackson, mm -hmm. is a sense that native people for their own good need to be removed to make way for uh, white settlers and for the expansion of cotton that, that, that Scott is, is talking about. So uh, the Indian Removal Act, uh, proper, probably best known, better known as the Indian Dispossession Act, mm -hmm. uh, you know, gets signed in 1830 and so the federal government is then is committed to removing indigenous people. So from Georgia, from uh, Florida, from the Carolinas, uh, you know, from Arkansas, um, people moved west and dispossessed and relocated in Oklahoma. So when Fitz says there's good reason to think of Oklahoma as being part of an extended south, that, that's, uh, that's one big reason why that would be the case. And I'll just yeah. piggyback on and with one observation. We tend to think about violent um, dispossession of Native Americans, especially in the West, and all of the tradition of Western movies and the violence that it depicts of U.S. cavalrymen versus Indians. But it's worth remembering the bloodiest war against American Indians was fought in Florida, the Seminole mm -hmm. Wars, which go, there are three of them. And so the violent occupation of Florida is very much a part of the story mm -hmm. of the emergence of the, what we now call the modern South. Mm -hmm. and through this whole book, I think one of the themes that you all talk about in your work and all the other authors talk about in their work is this idea of expanding kind of the concept of who gets to be considered Southern in this case. So whose history is going to be included in this book is very, very yeah. different <laughs> than whose history would have been included in a book like this 50 years mm -hmm. ago. Right. Uh, so I'd love to hear from all of you about that process and in the scholarship as well, so both within this work, but this is off, um, obviously a reflection of many other things that y'all have been working on for quite some time. Um, can you talk about how that definition of Southern has gotten expanded and kind of where you see that potentially going forward? Well, I, I certainly think that the definition has been utterly transformed over the last half century. And there, it's not just, uh, I, I would call it a, no pun intended, a revolution in the study of the early South. Mm -hmm. When I was in graduate school, the center of colonial scholarship was still New England and the Middle Atlantic. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was wonderful scholarship on the Chesapeake Bay, but that was really the kind of Southern extension. 
if somebody, so there was, a, there was a particular focus on early American history that excluded large parts of the South. In addition, uh, we think back that it's not really until the 1970s that there starts to be a large body of scholarship on women, black women, indigenous women, white women in the American South. Uh, prior to 1970, it's, count on two hands probably, the major scholarly works that talked about women. Um, and then the, the scholarship on black Southerners has just exploded in depth. Uh, we know so much more about slavery than we did just 50 years ago. So I think it's, it's not just that the definition of Southerners has changed, but the richness with which we can talk about all of the people who we now call Southerners has been transformed over the last 50 years. Just to follow up, and what we think of as Southern, so many of those things, mm -hmm. understanding the African roots of them. You talk about the Gullah and the Geechee. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about the, um, the sort of religious uh, tr traditions, Grigri and stuff like that so that's in, that c comes out of New Orleans. Um, I talk about, you talk about jazz, I talk about blues. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about uh, cooking and, and its relationship to African um, traditions of food and, and uh, feeding oneself and, and that understanding that part of the South means that a lot of the things that we think of are, that are actually interesting about the South that are actually beautiful about the South mm -hmm. actually come from uh, the African part of the South and that uh, that tradition is is lost in the way that in which that was spoken of before where we get our accents from where mm -hmm. Southerners get their accents from it used to be told as this somehow there was this English tradition that was carried on in the Chesapeake, and now we understand that it's an African um, kind of melding of African and European traditions that make much of the language that we talk about. And also, music is part, has this African American roots, has Native American roots, and that uh, it's a richer South. It's the South that we actually uh, admire, <laughs> right? The, the South that we actually like. Much of it is we need to kind of see the gumbo there. We need to see the the uh, bringing together of all these rich and complicated and struggling uh, cultural traditions. Mm -hmm. can, can I just jump in picking up on food? Yeah. I like to tell my undergraduates that I ask them, where is Progresso? Where did the Progresso food company start? It's a New Orleans company started by Sicilians. <laughs> New Orleans has the second largest Sicilian population in the United States. And I asked them, what's the most famous sandwich you associate with New Orleans? They usually say a po' boy, and I say, no, that's a much more recent. It's a muffaletta, which is, <laughs> again, a Sicilian. It's Sicilian influences being embraced in this incredibly interesting and uh, cosmopolitan city. I would, I would say as well that the, the, uh, the, the, the sense of cultural uh, and demographic diversity you know, is, is really a, a, a function of this earlier period, the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, when the South is a period, was a, a place of incredible uh, immigration, a destination for immigrants from the British Isles, from Germany, from, uh, from Switzerland, not France, you know, uh, Spain, as well as dozens and dozens of enslaved people from Africa, speaking many, many different languages, practicing different religions, encountering indigenous people likewise speaking many languages and practicing their traditions. So that, I mean, to me, that's when we think about Southern distinctiveness and Southern, um, uh, well, a, a sense of Southern uniqueness, perhaps, that, that this, uh, the, the collision of all these cultures during the 18th century um, was probably unprecedented, I, I think, in, in the region's history. And, and, and contributes to all the kinds of gumbo that you know, these <laughs> dollars are talking about. Uh, Literal uh, figures. Yeah, I would also say that the, you know, the, the way in which the South used to be taught was Jefferson and Jackson and mm -hmm. the, the political elites. And, and to me, the, everything that's interesting about the South comes from the <laughs> slave quarter and the hillbilly hideout, right? The places that are actually separated from the, that, that, the kind of elite Southern uh, tr traditions. And so telling that South uh, telling the story of that South is, I think, interesting and, and fascinating to people. And I'll, I'll piggyback with one other thing that I think is important for us to remember about the South. When I was being introduced to the history of the South, I always heard about the Southern sense of place. And I don't deny, Southerners have a deep sense of place. But so do Vermonters, <laughs> so do French Quebecers, so do lots of people have a sense of place. But 
one of the things I think is striking about Southerners is we tend to think of rootedness, and yet Southerners have been an incredibly, and I'm, I mean this by African American, by indigenous peoples, they've been incredibly migratory people. And so, for example, in the antebellum era, some of the most mobile Americans, according to the census, were Virginians who were migrating out of Virginia in numbers larger than migrating out of New England. Uh, so that they're, those Southerners who are, whether they be coerced or they're moving by choice, who are populating the, tennis, uh, the Mississippi River Valley, they're all moving all the time. And then they're moving into Louisiana, they're moving into the Mississippi Delta. So it's a very mobile population in this region that we tend to think of as being very sedentary. And that's because we think about the Southerners who stayed behind. And forget about all those Southerners who are migrating out to Texas, then migrating out to Bakersfield, California, or migrating to Chicago and Detroit or Pittsburgh. So it's a mobile people adjusting to generational upheaval after generational upheaval. Well, we were talking earlier about how scholarship on Southern history in the former decades um, tended to focus on just specific groups of people, specific histories. I mean, now the history that we have and we have access to and we're continuing to study is much more rich and inclusive of lots of different types of people. Um, I did want to ask about sources because I think that can sometimes be a little confusing to people about, well, if it's, it's history, it happened, how can it be new history? So um, I've wondered, I mean, each of you uh, study such different aspects of Southern history. Um, I always think it's interesting to know um, how, how that process has changed over the years of research and actually where you find some mm -hmm. of this really cool stuff that you write about. <laughs> I, I've got a story about Henry Grady. So mm -hmm. there's Henry Woodfin Grady, who everyone has heard about, uh, you know, editor of the Atlanta Constitution. Mm -hmm. But luckily for me as a scholar, there was another Henry Grady, Henry A. Grady, who was a railway carpenter. Um, and the Southern Historical Collection at UNC bought, uh, sight unseen, this massive collection of a white railroad worker's letters to his sister because they thought he was that Henry Grady. And <laughs> so that was fantastic for me. The only bound to side of this is that he wrote on brown paper with a purple crayon because that's what he used for measuring uh, wood with. Uh -huh. And so, uh, and his spelling was atrocious. It was really awful. But um, Henry A. Grady is horrified by the South. He moves through the South. He builds the South. He builds these railroad bridges with others. He's a railway carpenter mm -hmm. and it, it eventually becomes a construction foreman. And, 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 and when he goes to Louisiana and Mississippi, he says it's so strange, it's so peculiar, it's so swampy, it's so ugly. I can't, under, you know, this, this, I don't want to be in this South. And meanwhile, Henry uh, W. Grady is talking about how the South is one thing. And we're all, you know, uh, this, is, this is the new South and it's, it's uh, the future. So sometimes um, the archive will lead you to people. Henry A. Grady, for, he's a white railroad carpenter, working class guy but he's the one kind of closest to the black railroad workers who talks about the kinds of work environments that they're in and the kinds of um, the track laying that they do. And, and, and so uh, it's, the archive is always ready mm -hmm. for a new kind of uh, history, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would say that uh, that question is particularly acute for my period where uh, the people that, that the, uh, the authors in my team writing about the sort of the Pre, uh, 18, pre 19th century South, uh, in particularly writing about indigenous Americans and African Americans, where many of the sources, most of the sources are actually written by Europeans. Mm -hmm. And so the question, how, do you, how can you study those people if they didn't leave their own sources? And so this, this has been a, a question that has, has really given historians a lot of food for thought over the past decades. And historians have made you know, pretty good strides in recent years trying to use what limited sources do exist mm -hmm. to try to uncover as best they can the thoughts, the inner voices, the, the sense of personality that, uh, that's revealed of indigenous people and African Americans when written by European sources. It's, it's a tricky thing, it's not easy to do, but that's the question. And then especially with indigenous history, archeology span is a, is a, is a, is a, you know, uh, a tool that's essential for people who write about Native American history. So you, you 
work with whatever sources you can, mm -hmm. and, and you try to make it as layered and as textured as possible, uh, given the understanding that it's not always easy to do. I'll use an example that goes back to when I first came to Atlanta. Uh, I wrote my dissertation, my first book about lynching in Virginia and Georgia. And when I did my research, you had to read newspapers on microfilm. So I read 50 years of the Atlanta Constitution, reading the first two pages and the fourth page, which was the editorial page, for 50 years. That's <laughs> Those of you who have not worked in microfilm may not appreciate what that was. It, it, it affected my eyesight, actually. Yeah. Wow. Um, I had to wear glasses for a few years. Um, and the scholarship on lynching has been transformed over the last 30 years. Um, and particularly in the last few years, I'll just throw out one example. The great Southern historian C. Van Woodward devoted in his entire corpus of scholarship, less than four pages in all of his scholarship to the topic of lynching. Uh, no one would write a comparable study of the length of his book and devote so little space to it. But as I say, when I was doing my, one of the reasons why was he was not, a, he, he wasn't a newspaper researcher to begin with. Um, but the research that I, it took me literally a year and a half to do for my dissertation, you can now do in 20, well, you could do it in a millisecond, uh, but then you'd have to read all the stories on newspapers.com or the Atlanta mm -hmm. atlantaconstitution.com. So in other words, to be able to do the research to track down lynching evidence is infinitesimally easier now than it was just 30 years ago. And so we know immensely more about not just lynchings, but also about attempted lynchings, which were incredibly hard to track down previously. So that would be an instance where the knowledge, so to speak, was there inert, but technology has made it possible to get to it so much more easily than we could have 10 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah. One, one other piece of uh, was a source that I use is folklore and mm -hmm. particularly uh, black music. So um, this st story of John Henry is something I've written uh, a book about, but also all of these track liner songs that were sung and then collected in the 19 teens and 20s, but go from the 1880s mm -hmm. to the 19 teens and track liner songs uh, sung by men who lined and relined tracked 100,000 of them in the American South uh, in 1900. Those songs are by people who it was, you know, if, if they're alive in 1880, it was illegal for them to read in 1860, right? Mm -hmm. And so getting, hearing their voices is very, very hard. And, and so that's why uh, folklore and folk songs, many of which become blues songs, mm -hmm. are uh, a source that we can use and discover tremendous uh, material about. Very cool. Well, we are going to move to audience questions here in just a minute. So be thinking about all the great questions that I know that you're going to have for, for our panel tonight. Um, but I want to take it to each of you, you know, you, you teach, uh, I think both, all of you teach both undergraduates and graduates, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you're around a lot, of, a lot of young people. You also write um, books that, uh, that people who are not historians and who are not students actually want to read. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> it was very well written. Um, and lot, lots to dig into there. Um, so this, the book obviously started, as you noted earlier, many, many years ago, but it kind of came out during a very interesting time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think we always live in interesting times, but I'll call it an interesting time uh, and an interesting moment for history right now because mm -hmm. there's a lot in the news every day and a lot of disagreements over whose history gets to be taught, how it gets to be taught, um, why it's important or not important to teach, and then what, what some of this stuff actually means. So I'm wondering how you encounter that in your classrooms, as I'm sure you do every day, versus when you get to, to get out a little bit and talk with, with folks who aren't currently students. Um, how have these conversations in the public sphere shaped or not um, the, your scholarship? Uh, that's, you know, that's a very, very rich question. And it's, it's also a moving target because for example, in North Carolina, there's legislation before the, the state legislature right 
at this moment mm -hmm. that will transform the way K through 12 students in the state learn history. Uh, I, I guess what I would say is two things. We have, we're in a world in which AP US history influences enormously what anybody in high school in the United States learns about American history now. And yet, on the other hand, we now have increasingly a kind of politicization of what we learn in, or what is taught in schools. And I, I, I actually am fairly optimistic mm -hmm. that we, the, those of us who are committed to the study of history and the teaching of history, I, I like to say we have the facts on our side. And so uh, if, if we have to engage in debates about the past, I think we're in a pretty good position to hold our own. Uh, and I, I don't say that with, you know, Pollyannish, but uh, if, if people want us to talk about, teach about the history of free market capitalism in the United States, bring it on. Mm -hmm. Let's start talking about slavery and how it fit into free market capitalism. Or let's start talking about railroads and the funding of railroads and what that meant, as you described, for people who used to be self-sufficient farmers, but then had to enter into the marketplace in order to get access to funding. So in, in my own way, I think it'll be a trench warfare, to use a military <laughs> metaphor. It's gonna be a long, arduous struggle, but I still think the facts are on our side. Uh, I would say, well, uh, since I teach in Florida, a state which has seen some <laughs> politicization of the curriculum um, over the past year or so, um, this is a, a question that we think about all the time in the classroom. I'll give you one example, which is that uh, in, I just finished teaching a course on the American Revolution, and those of you who, who may have been following the controversy about the 1619 Project, which came out you know, a few years ago, and one of the contentions of the 1619 Project was that uh, the preservation of slavery was a, a, a driving inspiration for the American Revolution itself. And while the claim was not new, it's been made by many historians long before the 1619 Project came along, it, 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 it somehow it resonated with the public and became very controversial. So we talked about that in our class and you know, to try to get students to, to, to weigh the evidence and you know, to what extent, if any, was, was slavery a part of the rationale for the American Revolution itself? And, and you know, we looked at the evidence and the evidence is pretty clear. It was not the only rationale, but it was a rationale. It's in the Declaration of Independence. And, and so, uh, you know, the students, you know, uh, had, I had to make them aware of the controversy and, you know, to what do you think about this? And so, I mean, this is the way in which historians operate from using evidence, looking at arguments, looking at counter arguments, try to come to your own best conclusions. And you know, so if we can do that as a society to take these controversial things and what is so wrong about thinking about this and what, what role does a state actually have in dictating what can and can't be taught in a classroom, uh, we have to counter those things with, with an honest look at the history based on evidence, that's what we do and that's what my students did and they concluded that yes, slavery was a part of the American Revolution. Um, I, my, I'm, I'm going to go at this orthogonally, I, I think, because I, I like the question about teaching and, and writing. And, and to me, teaching is exciting. And I, I, I teach the big U.S. survey, 300 students. Um, and these are the students who did not get a five on the AP exam. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they got the three and the four. And they are not history majors. They will never be history majors. They will be dragged kicking and screaming into history. And I love that. I love being the person who... Has, you know, and they can't graduate from UGA without <laughs> having a history, a U.S. history course. So um, I say, look, you know, you're going to take you're, you're going to take a class. You're going to get a job. You're going to, um, and the job is going to be very closely related to the to the course you're taking. So agricultural economics or whatever it's, it's uh, uh, fashion design. And you're going to you're going to get into uh, that job, and you're going to hate your life and you're going to drink yourself to death. Uh, or you can think about where you fit in the, in the past, in the long past of the American history. How do you fit and how did other people cope with the world around them? How did they uh, confront the problems of their generations and how will you do it? 
That's the question. I want to save you from alcoholism. I want to save you <laughs> from uh, that world. And so uh, let's start to talk about American history. And then when I talk about your period, I say, so we can't understand American history, uh, the, the colonization without drugs, because they're all drugs. Coffee, sugar, tobacco, cocoa. Uh, it's, and so basically, this is a drug world. If we think about the American South, it's a world of drugs that are being shipped back to Europeans. So. Um, I think, I think uh, trying to get their attention, the attention of an engineering student who would rather be anywhere else, would rather be stuck in traffic than be in an American history class, uh, when, you, when you can get them excited about history, when you get them to think, you know, turn their head and think uh, a little bit differently about it, then I think my job is done. And uh, there's a feedback loop where when you teach and you get students excited and you get interested then you think, oh, well, that's actually a good story. I need to write that down, right? I need to tell that story. And so to me, that's the exciting thing about history as a writing discipline is that it can grow out of a good class. And it's often really good, really sharp, really skeptical questions from students that often push me to, they ask me, you know, what does is, what is the financial revolution have to do with um, the colonization of the new world and the creation of slavery, and I have to go back and look at it and think about it a little more. And uh, so, so I, I, there's a, to me a, a really exciting thing about skeptical students and teaching skeptical students and learning how to tell a story that's uh, that works. And then going back to the sources, of course, because we're all historians. We can't just tell a good story. Mm -hmm. um, we have to we have to have the sources that that are on our side, and that's. Uh, and I think so much of this book is like that, right? It's, yeah. it's um, these are, these are the, some of the best gems that we've kept, right, mm -hmm. it, for our classes that we just have decided that, uh, to, bo to boil down and to, uh, to present to your story about um, the Great London Fire of 1666 mm -hmm. and how it um, is a really important precursor to the coming of slavery in the, in the South, that the, sh the transition to slavery in the Virginia colonies has a lot to do with the London Fire of 1666. Mm -hmm. that, you know that that's that's fa fascinating and, um, and and makes you think twice. And I think that's there's, there's, the book is filled with observations and nuggets like that that are uh, just fantastic. Yeah, I completely agree. And it's never a bad thing to push you know everyone to actually show their work and show their sources, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So it, you know that yeah. it's those questions coming actually I think are an, an opportunity, right, to to talk about things that maybe mm -hmm. we haven't haven't talked about collectively mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. But we want to hear from you now. So I'm sure there are lots of questions. So um, please raise your hand nice and high so we can see you, and the microphone will come to you. How important were slave narratives in African American oral histories in your research and actually the outcome of the book? I, I'll, I'll start off just briefly. I think um, particularly in Martha Jones' chapter uh, and Kate Mazur's chapter, so chapters that deal with the anti, I'll call them the early republic, so roughly 1820 to 1860, uh, the slave narratives definitely are important, as well as particularly Martha Jones is interested in how black, we will call them now black Southerners, are seeing themselves as residents of the region and as Americans and as members of a black diaspora, an African diaspora. So their, their voice is very important. And again, Kate Mazur's chapter, she actually uses Sol Solomon Northup as a kind of organizing figure. So uh, they're definitely an import, very important voice. I'll just say that the ex-slave narratives written in 1933, collected in, in the, during the Depression, are great not just for the period of slavery, but for the period after slavery. Mm -hmm. so, so if you want to talk about um, black life in the 1870s and 1880s, Zora Neale Hurston is one of the people who's collecting these materials. and her descriptions of the kind of intricacies of black life grow out of those slave narratives and they're fantastic sources. What impact did the Great Migration have on the economy, the demographics of the South, and was there resistance to people trying to move to Chicago, New York, especially employers 
when their employees were trying to move away to those urban areas up north. So, uh, so the, the, the Great Migration is, is not um, in, in my period, it's, it's, um, it's work that's later. Um, no, it's, it's, it's very important. It's, it's important, it's critical to understand um, sort of what makes the Great Migration possible, which is uh, a war in Europe, World War I, uh, submarine warfare makes it impossible for uh, uh, employers in Detroit and uh, Chicago to get um, a stream of European workers, and so we see um, sleeping car porters and others bring black newspapers from Detroit and Chicago down to the South to show them about people about the opportunities that are available, and those there's a there's a there's a massive migration that does it changes the North um, and, and in in important ways it also but it, what it changes about the South is um, is equally important that there's a kind of uh, continuous movement of people back and forth called the Chitlin Circuit, which is a is a cultural um, uh, tradition, and, and much of what we think of as the blues comes out of that tradition. And um, we see a lot of the most horrific violence that comes um, up, up is, is, is the period after. Formally, we talk about lynching as being sort of 1877 to 1914, but, but um, it's the Red Summer of 1919 that uh, sees tremendous violence uh, against uh, black people in many parts of the South. In fact, I have a, a PhD student who just wrote about Red Summer in uh, 1919, so it's fresh, fresh in my mind. And um, we see, uh, yeah, sort, sort of um, the destruction of important black cities, black towns where black people are thriving that um, are uh, just grim. And so that, that is discussed in the, in the 20th century. So it's out of my field, out of my period, but um, there's a great deal uh, that's talked about Red Summer in particular. And I'll just add your, your question about efforts to stop it. There were definitely efforts to stop it. For example, here in Georgia, there were efforts to stop trains from leaving Savannah and elsewhere. Mm. Um, but there's the, the classic example of way American federalism and American capitalism work. There were, of course, recruiting agents coming down from northern industrial centers, recruiting blacks to migrate north. And so there are, just as there are people trying to keep them in the south, white landowners, white employers, there are also white employers in the north moving heaven and earth to get them to come north. So there were subsidies to, to migrate, et cetera. So there, there's a tug and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's, they're countervailing forces in a way. And then of course, black people in the South, many of them were very eager to get out. And so uh, they, they found their way. I, I'd be interested in your comments on uh, uh, the way in which uh, white supremacy and uh, in the South uh, created distortions in constitutional law and in the legal structure, not only in the South but federally, and whether you think those distortions persist today, and if so, in what form? Let's, go first? Yeah. Um, wow. So. Uh, one of the things, I mean, so, so some of these are constitutional and some of them aren't. So, so one thing that occurs to me is that there were things called the Black Codes passed in 1866 um, by uh, when white, uh, when Andrew Johnson is president, he brings in, uh, it basically allows Southern states to reconstruct themselves with just white voters. Uh, they create a bunch of laws that make it basically illegal to be black and in a city and you have to have uh, papers and things like that. Um, the Fourteenth Amendment is an attempt, uh, and the re and military reconstruction, radical reconstruction, is called, um, is an attempt to prevent that from happening, right? And so, and so to say, okay, these states are not. The Congress says these states are not states anymore; they're territories. There'll be military governors; they'll have to be, uh, you know, bring peace to these regions before they can be brought back in as states. And so, I would argue that the Black Codes never went away in 1866, so that, for, that things that formally said that bl black people cannot you know, uh, enter into marriages or can't testify against white people, those things are stricken from state constitutions. But there are many other things, like very, very high um, uh, fees. So, so, so you, a relatively low uh, amount of, if, if, you, if, if you take something, 
that's worth less, anything more than $10, it's a felony in 1866 in Virginia. Uh, the bar was $30 in Virginia uh, before the war. And there's an attempt to identify things that are associated with, that they see as associated with black men and women, that take those things from misdemeanors and turn them into felonies. And so that, uh, the 14th Amendment, there, there are attempts after the 14th Amendment for the states to sort of get around the 14th Amendment. And the way they do that constitutionally is what are called the Supreme Court cases, uh, the, the um, sorry, uh, the Supreme Court cases, the civil rights cases. Uh, and those basically say, um, as long as the state doesn't say it's designed to exclude black people, it's okay, right? So the, the 14th Amendment still holds, everyone is a citizen. Um, you can't deny citizenship based on race, color, previous condition of servitude. But if, if a state passes a law and it doesn't say it's doing that, but it has the effect of doing that, then it's perfectly fine. That's what the Supreme, uh, those Supreme Court cases do. And so it allows states tremendous power to uh, take, uh, create white supremacy and basically force black voters out. Black people are voting in the 1860s and 1870s after the Supreme Court, um, those, those um, uh, civil rights cases, um, we see the understanding clauses being brought. We see the um, poll, taxes. poll taxes and what's the third one? Poll taxes, understanding clauses and, um, oh, grandfather clauses. And the grandfather clauses basically says, okay, maybe you can't read the Constitution. Okay, uh, maybe you didn't pay your poll tax, but did your grandfather vote? <laughs> and so there's an, there's an exception, a loophole made for white people who don't pay the poll tax or, or uh, and so, yeah, so, so uh, the Supreme Court does basically weaken the 14th Amendment. Um, it's a powerful instrument when it's passed in 1866, but it doesn't really come into force in the South in many ways until 1966, 100 years later. That's, that's, that's my take. Um, uh, but, uh, of course, my specialty is the period from, you know, uh, the, the 70s and 80s. And I'll just throw out, I think one consequence of that, as, as Scott was describing it, is that citizenship for other groups who don't enjoy the privileges of whiteness was also extremely circumscribed. So you can, you can see the struggle of the 20th century, in essence, 20th century expansion of the 14th Amendment as an effort not just to compensate for, for the extremely restricted uh, notion of citizenship as it had developed in the South, but also across the country. So that would apply to um, Hispanic Americans in the Southwest as well. So there was segregation in California public schools on the basis of Asian identity as well as Hispanic identity. And that had to be corrected along with white supremacy in the American South. One thing that's not discussed much is the fact that it's also, you can't be on a jury if you're not a citizen. And so that means that juries, it's not just that white people are allowed to vote, but, but juries are only white then by the 1880s and 1890s. And that's very important for understanding the sort of interpretation of crime is that when, if you are a white person brought into a jury, you're surrounded by white people, you collectively define what's legal and illegal, what's acceptable and, and unacceptable based on your understanding of the law and the understanding of these cases, and that, tends to shape people's minds around the idea that crime is black and that order and law are white. And so it, it pulls people into a kind of white supremacist vision. Uh, and, the, and the juries, I think, the fact that juries then are white, um, but black people are not allowed to have juries of their own peers is very important for understanding the rise of lynching. Uh, and, and these other things, because lynching becomes a kind of extra legal justice, but this presumption is that justice is primarily a white uh, phenomena. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you again to our panel, Fitzhugh Brundage, John Sensbach, and Scott Nelson. The book is A New History of the American South. Um, I hope that you all read it. I hope that you will um, get a lot out of it. I know that I did. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you to, you, to thank the you audience for being here at Atlanta History Center tonight. And we will see you all again very soon, I hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, and we will meet all of you out in the lobby for a book signing. So don't forget, Christmas is not very far away. <laughs> Get your extra copy. <laughs>